good afternoon. There's a lot of power in this microphone. Is everybody having an awesome day? Well, welcome to the Bush Auditorium on this beautiful day in the beautiful campus here at Rollins College. A uh, special welcome to those that are joining us via live stream. My name is Boo Gonzalez, and I have the privilege of serving as secretary on the Crummer Alumni Board. Um, and so I'd like to welcome my fellow board members, fellow alumni today. Um, on behalf of the Alumni Association, I'd like to sincerely thank everyone for joining us this afternoon, and I have the privilege and honor of welcoming uh, Dr. Excuse me, Dean Deborah Crown. Thank you, Boo, and thank you all so much for joining us. And I have the privilege of introducing Craig, and one of the challenges I found was that we have an hour. I could have spent an entire hour going through Craig's accomplishments because they are simply so magnificent. But we took an academic approach. So instead of me just talking about all of his accomplishments, we gave you a reading because this is Crummer and this is Craig's last lecture. So you have a reading that details so many of the things that he's done. And someone was asking me if we were going to send you a quiz on this later. <laughs> we won't unless Craig sends it to you just on his own. Um, but before I do an introduction of Craig, I just want to recognize a few of our special guests that are here. And the first person I want to recognize is someone we all owe our thanks, respect, and appreciation because without her support, I don't think Craig, Craig, these flowers aren't for you, that Craig would have been able to do everything that he has contributed to Crummer, to Rollins, and to us in the Thank you, Nancy. And although she's not able to be with us tonight, I am looking up because um, Dorothy McAllister, Craig's mother, is live streaming in. So the, one of the people responsible for Craig <laughs> is here, so I thought we need to also thank her as well. And so... <laughs> Now, Craig's daughters, Melissa and Kristen, are here, and his daughter, Heather, is watching us from Las Vegas. I think, though, some of the people that Dr. McAllister is the most excited to see happen to be sitting in the first two rows, and that is Sophie and Katie, his granddaughters, and his grandsons, Larson and Cooper, and his grandsons, Colin and Mark, are also watching from Las Vegas. Thanks, you guys. I really appreciate it, and I know your papa is thrilled to see you here. Um, we also have other dignitaries, and we have so many people. I'm just going to highlight a few. Um, Boo talked about our alumni board members and all of the things that they do throughout the year. Alan. Keen and Bill Bieberbach are seated here. Our Board of Overseers members, I see uh, Jim Barnes, I see uh, John Riley, David Odahowski is here, uh, Ginny and Bob Finfrock. Thank you for everything that you contribute to Crummer and Rollins and your partnership with Craig for all of these years. I also want to recognize, and it is unusual that I don't see him, um, because maybe I should have him stand up, and that is our president, um, Grant and Peg Cornwell, Susan Singer, our provost, who are here with us as well. We also have some past deans 
in the audience and Dean's families. Sam Serto, I'm looking for Sam. Sam Serto and Susan Moses are with us as well. And all of our alums, um, thank you, not just for coming to Craig's almost last lecture, and I was telling John I wasn't sure if I was gonna share this or not, because we kinda have to keep this language of the last lecture in this room. Those of you that are students, okay, this isn't his last lecture. <laughs> Remember, you still have class, and he still will be there. Um, so his almost last lecture. But as we approach kind of the end of alumni weekend, there really is no better way to cap it off than the man who did so much for so many of us. And so you can read this, and I'm gonna tell you just a few more things that you may not know that Craig has done. So in addition to being the Steinmetz Professor of Management, I think everybody knows that he also did serve as acting president, interim provost. We tease him that we think um, maybe the only job that you haven't done, Craig, is the gardener role. <laughs> and Nancy tells us that's not a good one for you. So it's, he oversaw so many of the changes in Crummer. Uh, the school, the graduate housing for international students, um, really is a testament to Craig. Launching the first AACSB accredited EDBA program, the Saturday program, the 16 month EA program, all of those were under Craig's leadership. The Center for Advanced Entrepreneurship and the Center for Leadership Development, which are amazing assets for Crummer, also under Craig's leadership. Under Craig, the school rose to the top of Forbes and Business Week rankings. And aside from everything that Craig does for us and continues to do every day, he has touched so many student lives and faculty lives. He hired um, over half of our faculty and staff. He has, under his tenure, graduated 40% of Crummer students. That's, that's amazing. That is unheard of. Craig's contributions, though, go to the business community as well as to higher education, where he is considered a rock star within AACSB. And while it's sad for us to say farewell, we know Craig well enough, we know he's gonna come back and, and visit and participate. We are so appreciative, Craig, of everything you do, and the biggest treat for us is the opportunity to hear how you define yourself, which is he is a teacher at heart. Thank you for the treat of allowing us to enjoy that one last time. <laughs> Thank you. Ah. Ah. Kind of weird to be at your last lecture. Well, almost last lecture. <clears throat> Done this a lot, talked to a lot of people, but this is different. And uh, I'm looking forward to it, but I will take a, 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 a moment to recognize Nancy also because for over 46 years, we've been partners in this journey, and we've uh, had wonderful outcomes. Uh, Heather, Melissa, Kristen, and then seven grandkids. So, I mean, you know, that's, that's truly joyous, and uh, it's made my life possible, and it's made our accomplishments. I also want to thank my Savior for everything he has done in guiding me through this life. And uh, I just want to thank my colleagues that are here, a lot of great memories, my staff, my team that uh, we put together over quite a few years, and just everyone that's here, alums, and friends of the college who have done so much for us. It's, 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 it's a blessing. It's a, truly a blessing to have uh, been in this role. So the last lecture is on leadership, because that's what I do. And uh, I, I titled it Leadership Lost because uh, I sometimes wonder where we're going 
And I'm sure that some of you sometimes wonder where we're going. By the way, hi, Mom. <laughs> so I want to start out with some definitions of leadership because it's hard to talk about something if you don't define it. And uh, so I apologize to some of my current students. You've seen some of these slides, but I've modified them and kind of condensed them. But uh, Kennedy talks about leadership and learning, indispensable, going back and forth. Uh, Eisenhower calls leadership an art. I never considered myself an artist unless I'm painting a room at the home, but uh, you know, that's as close as I get. But I'm thinking all the way back to Aristotle. Definition of leadership is to inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more. Wow. 384 BC. Isn't that amazing? Uh, and then uh, John Maxwell, one of the current uh, gurus in leadership, and by the way, there's hundreds of gurus. They're everywhere. I share with my class all the different books that they've written, and the only thing I have, and the reason I do that is I'm just jealous, you know, that I didn't write any of those books. But John Maxwell calls it, a leader's one who knows the way, goes the way, shows the way. So if that's a context for leadership, let's talk about some of the issues in leadership. Well, the problem here, and we're going to talk about problems, we'll come back to problems because that's where a lot of this is based, is Cotter says we're overmanaged and underled. Wow. Have you seen that in your workplaces? A friend of mine, Rick Boyatzis, up at Case Western has done research, and look at that. Empirical research, at least 80% of people in leadership positions are not effective. Is that not sad? It's, it's a sad commentary, and this is one of the problems that I want to talk about. And uh, Gallup said that only 21% of employees feel that they are led and managed in a motivating way. 21%. I think that's a problem. And it's something that I hope that we begin to address. So what the problem continues. I'm going to go on with some of the context of the problems. Uh, you know, in the old days, we talked about this. And now we talk about the volatility, the uncertainty, the complex issues, the generational issues, and how technology is just taking over. You know, if you, if you read the singularity, they talk about that uh, by 2029, the computers at your desk at home will be smarter than the human being. They will have more intelligence than a human does, which is kind of Orwellian, if you think about it, and you, you hear, you know, movies about this type of stuff, but, you know, that's going to be huge when your laptop is that powerful. I mean, you can say right now that, uh, the folks at IBM have kind of started that, but this will be on your, on your desktop. Einstein, my favorite quote from Einstein's, and this is, gets into this, is problems can't be solved with the same mindset that created them. So as we go forward with all these problems, the mindset of before, yesterday, is not going to solve the problems tomorrow because the problems have changed so drastically and so, so dynamic of a change. So for not leading, what's the impact on industry? Well, the impact on industry is, is really amazing. 70% of the variance in culture is attributed to leaders and managers. And if you think about what leadership is, leadership is nothing if it's not culture. It is the culture that we live in in our workplace. And if culture's good, the weather's good. If culture's not good, the weather's not good. And the statistics for that say that employees in 2014 in a Gallup survey, only 31% of employees indicated they were actively engaged in the enterprise. 51% were not engaged. And 17% were actively disengaged. Just think about that. When was the last time you were in an organization and you ran into one of these people? They were the ones that gave you exceptional service and made you feel really valued as a customer. And, uh, but if you look at this, add those two numbers up, that's pretty, pretty sad. It's almost 70%. 
These people and these people, our productivity, we're leaving on the table in organizations. It's productivity that's not showing up in helping other people, helping organizations, and I would argue it's also not showing up anyplace else. So you come over here, the good news is, compared to the rest of the world, <laughs> only 15% of employees worldwide are engaged. So the good news is that's why America is still powerful, but not very impressive. And employees who have changed their jobs in the last three years, 35%. People are, are voting with their feet. They're not sticking around. They're not doing what we need them to do. So managers, another piece of the Gallup data, is likely to provide 3.5% more engaged if they have a meaningful feedback from their bosses. Wow. Just by giving meaningful feedback, we can increase 3 and a half times, I would call that pretty significant. And I'd call it pretty sad that we're not doing it to a lot of our people. So this is what we look like at work. I just try to hope that when I teach a class, that's not what the class looks like. <laughs> Another issue is managers and leaders not leading, but the other issue is this whole issue of generational changes. What's going on in our world? And uh, Morris Massey once said that we are what we are because of where we were when. And when we grew up and where we grew up set the frame that kind of works in our in the backgrounds of our mind. And this is how we filter things. This is how we kind of look at things. So if you look at the silent generation, this generation is the generation that was the great generation. They're the ones that survived the Great Depression and, and World War II. They grew up in very, very troubled times, and they grew up in times that really forged in them who they are. My favorite example here is my father-in-law, Nancy's dad. Is my father was uh, in plumbing and heating and taught me the, the skills to be in plumbing and heating, so I had an electricity. And, but he also taught me every day, when you're done at your work site, you clean up. And so every night, you know, when I was redoing the bathroom in our 1940s house, uh, I would go through and throw everything in the dumpster, and I'd be doing things. And one weekend, he came over to help. And so I'm throwing scraps of lumber in, and he said, boy, kid, you must be rich. I was like, what, uh, huh, rich? You know, I'm making $7,800 a year. I'm certainly not rich. He said, well, you just threw away 35 cents worth of lumber. That piece of lumber right there is 35 cents. And that one over there? And I'm like, holy cow. But that's because of when they were born and the way they looked at things. They tended to work for the same company most of their lives. Their form of communication initially was letters. And then telephones with party lines and those weird things attached to the wall with the coiled cords. You know, there was no portability in communication. Then we came along, and what formed us? Well, if you go down to the bottom, what formed us was the Cold War. I remember in, in school, duck and cover. I never realized that a desk could protect me from radioactive fallout. But it certainly could, I guess, because that's what they taught me to do. Duck and cover. We also had the, the Vietnam War and the Cold War and, you know, the moon landing and Woodstock. And, you know, Woodstock was one of those really cool things. But Vietnam wasn't one of the cool things. It was, unfortunately, one of the first wars we got into that the public didn't seem to support, which was really sad for our vets. So what happens here is I grew up in this piece of area. We are definitely into telephones. We're not quite into email, at least not until, you know, uh, quite, a, quite a few, until our good friend uh, invented the internet. <laughs> but you know, it's interesting. The silent generation wanted their kids to do better. And so, this is another difference in the world, is I remember when I was selecting college a long time ago, 
I found three different schools and I applied to all three of them. I had a safe school, an aspirational school, and then, you know, a good school. And I got accepted at Arizona. Figure out which one that was. <laughs> so how have things changed in academia? Well, I remember on a Saturday morning at six o'clock in the morning, Dad and I got in my 66 Mustang. We filled it up with gas and we left for Tucson. And we drove and we drove and we drove and Sunday afternoon we arrived in Douglas, Arizona. We called mom and said, we're here. And she said, no, you're not. You can't be there. It's only Sunday afternoon. He said, no, we're here. We drove straight through. Thank goodness those are the years without radar or any type of things that could control the speed. So I remember when dad was asleep in the car, we would go a little faster. And uh, that got us there the next morning. So two days later, he drives me to Arizona. And uh, we pull up to the campus. We pull up to my dorm. He helps me move everything in the dorm. And next thing you know, he's gone. That was parent orientation in the 60s. <laughs> he, he abandoned me, yeah. Here's a little kid from a dairy community, 1,700 people, in Tucson, Arizona, surrounded by people that didn't speak English, that weren't like me, and it's like, but dad, and he was gone. <laughs> you know, I think about that because I think about the whole concept of how's education changed. Now when parents bring their kids, we have parent orientation, where we prepare the parents for their kids to come to school. And I, I don't know how the current president thinks, but I thought that was one of the strangest things I had to do as acting president, was to tell parents how to prepare for your kid to be in college. <laughs> wow. So then Nancy and I, we fell in love, and we had our kids, which are the Gen Xers. Think about their, their world. They were in a period of time where the Berlin Wall fell. We won the Cold War. So no more duck and cover. And computer gaming was just starting coming out. And all the boomers who were just wild and crazy started getting lots of divorces. And so it changed the filter. It changed the, the life of my kids. So they grew up in a different environment than we did. They now were, Al Gore had finally invented the internet, and so they were able to do things like text and do interesting things like that. And, uh, but they were different. I was very much into work, and Nancy, fortunately, was very much into the family. But what you find with the X-Geners is they are also very family-focused. So if you look at my daughters and, and their husbands, they're very active in their kids' lives. I mean, there's softball games, there's uh, dance recitals, there's regular baseball, there's all kinds of plays and musicals. They're less likely to have lived, and this is the first generation that the people will tell you probably didn't, won't live or didn't live as well as their parents. Because all through the history of, of America, it was always the next generation does better. I still think they will, and I'm, I'm optimistic. And then we have my grandkids. Wow, grandkids, who would have figured? Text and social media. My grandkids are so socially and textual and computer literate, it's absolutely scary. When the youngest ones come to our house and visit, they do things to Nancy's iPhone that we cannot figure out how to undo. <laughs> Nancy comes to me and says, fix it. And I'm like, how am I going to fix it? Give it to the genius that just unfixed it, you know. <laughs> Have them fix it. But the millennials are very different. They came up in a different world. They came up in a world with the rise of 9-11 in terrorism, school shootings and all kinds of things. This is a, a different type of filter that they will use. And because of this and because they are so tech savvy, they're more likely to leave companies because they want to go someplace that's cooler, someplace that's more exciting, more challenging, you know. I, I move to a lot of different places to move ahead. They're going to move to a lot of different places 
because they want to, because they can. And that's what's going to be fun to them. And so what you, then we got the Gen I's and the Gen Z's, and these are the youngest of my grandkids. Wow. They've experienced the 2007-2008 recession. And so I don't think they're going to measure the amount of money in wood in 25 cents or 30 cents, but it's a little bit different. These are all things that go into the filter. So look at this. By 2030, millennials outnumber boomers by 22 million. And what's the impact in the workplace for that? Well, as dean and provost and college presidents, uh, there's this term about helicopter parents. Parents that kind of hover over their kids. You know, when I played in sports in school, if you weren't really good, you didn't play. And you didn't get a letter unless you played so many games. Now everyone gets a trophy, and I'm happy for them. But the thing is, what happens is, these helicopter parents are hovering over their kids. I used to joke with people and say, I no longer call them helicopter parents, I call them Blackhawk parents. Because <laughs> now they're not just hovering, they're, they've got armed and authorized, you know, to, to shoot. <laughs> and you, you laugh, but I guess, tell you what, you know, if you're in business, it's coming to you. I've already talked to people that parents have come to job interviews with their kids. And I was talking to some executives up in Atlanta that said parents got involved when the kid got their first performance review and felt, felt the boss was not fair with a performance review. So, you know, the world is changing, and it's going to change what we need to consider as leaders. So, what do we have? There's some people retiring up here. <laughs> And, you know, as long as enough people keep working, we'll still have Social Security, so we're good. But we're finding that there's not enough technical ta talent. As we get more and more complex, who's going to make all this more and more complex work until we get smart androids that are able to fix, you know, everything automatically without people? We still have a huge need. Right now, the airline industry doesn't have enough pilots because of the FAA's mandatory retirement. And so, you know, you find that we are not training enough technically qualified people. And with millennials moving a lot, where will we find consistency in employment, in people staying in jobs? And where will we find the culture playing out? And succession planning is just, it's a joke. You don't see succession planning working very well in the 90s and in 2000 era, GE used to have with Jack Welch a legendary succession planning process. You don't see that anymore. <laughs> and so who's going to prepare the next leader? And this is what worries me. Because if we've got leaders already that aren't actually leaders, who's going to train people to be leaders if there's not already leaders? Think through your careers if you're old enough to have a career. Forty five years, you know, in my career, if you count when I graduated from college. In 45 years, I've had three people that I call true leaders. Fortunately, I had one right out of college, Jerry Buzan, who was my manager when I worked for Consolidated Foods. And I had him for about a year until I moved, got a promotion and moved to California. I had to wait until 1983 to get my next one. And that was Tony Labita, who I worked for for almost four years. And he's the one that, you know, kind of mentored me and encouraged me to get my doctorate. Then you have to go fast forward in 94 when I worked for Ed Moses, who was the third person that I felt cared about me as a leader. So what's happening is, to be a leader, you need a mentor. You can't be a leader just by saying, I'm the boss. Four in 10 US workers are now working for someone younger than them. Who's mentoring them? If your boss is younger than you, who's mentoring? 71% of employees are open to leaving. Something better comes along and define better. I was out in Silicon Valley. Out there, better isn't money because everyone in Silicon Valley gets a lot of money. They go because they like the technology at that other place better than they liked it where you're at. So they're crossing the street, not for money, which I would have, 
but they're crossing the street because it's more sexy, it's more fun. So just in a lot of things that are going on in the workplace. To me, you're not a leader if you don't manage a culture. The culture is the glue that holds an organization together. And what I see is a lot of organizations that do not have culture. And if the leader doesn't provide a culture, where does the climate come from? Remember how many people in the organization walking around disconnected, <laughs> un, un, unreliable? If I don't provide it, it's going to come from someplace. And that's not what leadership is. So, what you find is board of directors who are responsible for companies feel they have a great understanding of the culture in the C-suite. Maybe they do. But the further down you go in an organization, they don't have a clue. National Association of Corporate Directors feels that boards are going to become responsible for cultures and organizations. That's going to be interesting because who are the leaders that are going to train people in culture? They're not there. So companies with stronger cultures outperform others in revenue, in shareholder return. We need leaders who understand culture. We need leaders that are going to make a difference in the organizations. So who have changed? Let's do a global look now. What is going on in the world? Well, look at the 20th century. What do you think about some of these names? These are people that changed the world in the 20th century. By definition, they led people. The sad thing is, if you look at a number of these, they led people in terrible directions. You know, there's a phrase that in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. If no one is providing leadership, where does leadership come from? It comes from the vacuum. And look at this. Winston Churchill, one of the people that changed the world, the 20th century. And what happened right after the war? It kicked him out. <laughs> he was just a good leader during the war, according to the people in the UK. But look at this. Hitler, ah, miserable. But somehow or another, he motivated and got an entire country to do terrible and awful things. That's the sad thing about leadership, is if you don't have good leaders and you leave a vacuum, who comes? <laughs> Not good ones. And some good names, Mandela, Martin Luther King, Stalin, eh, not, not too good there. <laughs> Gorbachev, yeah, yeah, got the wall down, yeah. Mother Teresa, I mean, how can you not love Mother Teresa? And then one business person made it in the 20th century. The guy that was in his garage trying a fruit company, get a fruit company on. Or, I mean, Microsoft, that was the other guy, Jobs, I'm sorry. But think about this. So, I want to say, well, what's going on right now? Who is considered to be leaders? Fortune 27. These are the top nine names and leaders in some of their pictures. So, just, just look at those. You know. <laughs> I couldn't resist. <laughs> You know, I know I'm retiring, but I'm still hoping there's some kind of perk out there. <laughs> <laughs> but do you all know who all these people are? Some very interesting people. We know who this guy is. Angela Merka, our good friend at the Chicago Cubs. General McMasters, Bezos. Uh, Melinda Gates. Guess what? Bill's off. Melinda's in the president of Taiwan, uh, Ma, who is the most successful entrepreneur in China, worth supposedly $30 billion if the government lets them keep it. But if you look at it, what's missing in this list? In my opinion, who's running the countries? 
you know, in Taiwan, yes, we've got uh, the president of Taiwan, but, and you've got the Pope who provides amazing leadership to the Catholic Church, is, is a transformational leader, as we would say, in leadership. But Bezos is one of the only company people here. And I would argue Jeff Bezos is indeed remarkable in what he's done. But is he a leader of people, or is he a leader of an industrial movement? And, and, and I would tend to put him more in a leader of an industrial movement than, in, than a true leader, because a lot of turnover in Amazon because of the working conditions. He expects a lot of, from the employees. And guess what? When you're dealing with millennials, they're going to stay for a while, but if it's not fun, they're going to go to the next internet type of startup business. So let's focus back on the problem. What's going on right now? Polarized perspectives. Everything you see is, if you're not with me, you're against me. You're either on this side of this issue or you're on this side of the issue. And the trouble is, where, where are we coming together? And this is what I worry about. This is, as I look forward to my grandkids and my children growing up, is if we can't start to get people away from these polarized positions, we're in deep, deep stuff. Global change in politics. I mean, it changes so fast. I mean, it changed just yesterday. You know, with a coalition coming together to, to, to uh, punish Syria for their actions, which were atrocious. So things change at an amazing pace, but think about the difference in communication. Communication is what is driving huge problems in this area. The digital revolution. Some of you in the room, you know, got your doctorates a few years back like I did. And you remember that the research process was the card catalog and going through and finding articles and hoping to find a good one that would lead you to another one. It was an interesting hunt process. Some of you did your dissertations on a typewriter. I started mine on a IBM Selectric, then a memory IBM, and then fortunately Apple came along, and so, you know, I had two floppy disks. Woohoo! 350K. <laughs> program, first chapter. Program, second chapter. And by the way, if they touch anything bad, it's gone. I lost chapter one once, never lost chapter one again. And by the time I was done, you know, I had my, I, I still remember, my students probably hate hearing this, I remember my first computer with a hard drive. It was a 10 megabyte hard drive. And I thought to myself, how in the world can you ever fill a 10 megabyte hard drive? <laughs> I mean, how many 350K disk is that? Like a, a zillion? I don't know, do the math. I'm not a math person. <laughs> but this technology, is just amazing. You can find out anything about anything. You can figure out how to fix an appliance in your house just by going to YouTube and watching six different people destroy it in six different ways, but <laughs> it's, it's there. And with artificial intelligence all coming together, it's gonna become even crazier. Instantaneous and continuous communication. How many cable network news stations are there? Thousands, hundreds, 365, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and what are they looking for? Someone who has their cell phone out taking a picture of someone doing something stupid or saying something stupid, which then dooms your political career. Unless certain people like that on the right or the left, then it kind of fires you up over there, but nothing is hidden anymore. Everything is out in the open. So when my grandkids have a test, mom and dad can see it that afternoon on the computer. Thank goodness they couldn't do that when I was a kid. <laughs> that would be scary, because I had a whole semester before something came out that I had to explain. The other thing is, both in politics and in business, there's a lack of a long-term perspective. Companies, it's profit focused 
versus growth focused. And that is a huge difference. When you're profit focused, I don't care how good it is, if it doesn't show me something this, this quarter or on this particular thing and Wall Street doesn't like it, we're done. And, and in government, I don't even know if anyone in government, I know the, the one long-term perspective I know about in government is if you're in Congress or in, you're in the Senate, you want to get reelected. That's your long-term perspective. And, you know, the look back versus forward perspective is, remember what uh, my quote is, we can't solve today's problems with the very things that caused them to happen. We have to really be forward focused. And this is where we in academia need to do a better job. And this is where we as voters need to do a better job in trying to get better people elected. Because if we keep reelecting the same people, we will get the same stuff. End of my political commentary. <laughs> so what drives real leadership? You can go to the books, you can go to Google and, and do it, and they'll give you 100, 200 characteristics of a leader. I've simplified it. First and foremost, if I don't trust you, you're not my leader. And if you don't have humility, I don't trust you. People will not follow someone they don't trust, period. And in my career, I've seen some of those people, and they say it stand out huge. In Washington, you've seen these people, they stand out huge. If you don't have this, you won't have a team. The ability to motivate and inspire. What is visioning? I'd love to go to, a, to, to some of these corporations and say, what's your vision of the corporation? Oh, we got this 20-year strategic plan, and we got this, and we got that, and it's like, no, no, that's not my question. What is our vision? What is the vision? Where are we going? Politicians don't have visions, they have slogans. And unfortunately, slogans are great for marketing, but they're not a vision. And then communication is absolutely essential. I watch you, if you're my leader. And I watch for what you say, then I watch what you do with what you say. And when those two jive, I trust you. When they don't jive, I begin to say, what is wrong with this person? Emotional intelligence. You are not a leader if you do not understand who you are. Because if you don't start here, you can't work out there. And there's too many people that are not aware of what they do to other people. More managers, in my opinion, more politicians need to come and listen to people without their handlers around them that say, this is what it's really like to be around you. And this is what I'd like to see people do, as I'd like to see people be more self-aware. Because when you're self-aware, then you can have empathy. Then you can be a servant leader, which is the, in my opinion, the best type of leadership. Servant leader, serving the people that work for you. And then what you find is leaders need to be lifelong learners. Remember? I think Kennedy said that. That was a long time ago he said that. You've got to be a teacher. You've got to be a coach. How many of you can honestly say your boss has been your teacher, your coach? Your boss really cares about you and knows more about you other than employee 25, 26, whatever. They have to be courageous and bold. And I've never seen a leader yet that's not a risk taker. If you're afraid to step out, you're not a leader. Because if you're a leader, some percentage of your employees are not going to like you. Because there's a number of people in your organization that don't want to see anything change until the day after they retire. Then you can do whatever the heck you want to the place. But leaders also have to expect results, have high expectations, and then inspire others to do their best. Sounds relatively straightforward, doesn't it? 
So why is it not there? Why are we not seeing it in our business leaders, in our academic leaders, in our government officials? Well, remember, Boyatza said 80% not doing their job. So I went and said, well, let's look at the government. In February, Congress's approval rating was 15%. That's because some are over here, some are over there. You know, and that number varies any month. You know, if it's a good month, it might get up to 19%. 20%. Uh, the president's rating was 40%, but his 40% was bimodal. Guess who liked him? <laughs> the right. Guess who hated him? The left and the people in the middle. I don't know if they hated him. I, I'm sorry. This number goes up and down the same way Congress goes up and down. I don't know. I didn't check it today to see what the, the Syrian missile strikes are going to do. But the thing is, who in Washington is doing our business as a leader with a vision of what America is. And this is, this is troubling. So, <laughs> where are they going to come from? They're going to come from places like Rollins. They're going to come from your neighbors. They're going to come from the nonprofit sector. They're going to come from all kinds of places. We, if we are going to move our country forward and have an impact on the world, we're going to have to start figuring out how we do a better job of training leaders. Because the, the alternative is bad. It's not good. And the thing is, we don't want another world war to have a world leader come forward as a positive leader. Wouldn't it be better to be proactive in this process? So here is a simple chart of the problem. Simon Sinek is the author of the Golden Circle, or the, I guess the founder of the Golden Circle. He says the problem with most organizations now, be it government, be it academia, be it industry, is everyone seems to operate in this outer circle. What are you doing? How come you're not doing this? People don't buy what you do. People really buy why you do something. And I always ask people, and I, they're doing things, I say, why are you doing that? And they'll almost always go to, well, this is, this is why. This is how we do it. No, how you do it is not why you do it. How you do it is how you do, how do you do what you do? Probably an acronym for that. But the thing is, too many organizations operate here. You even see it in marketing. Buy this car. Look at car advertisements. Ooh, man, the tops down, you know, beautiful models driving this car at excessive speeds and, you know, no cars on the road. You see these off-road vehicles, you know, with, you know, so far off the ground that, but they're driving down a road. They're not driving off-road. People buy the what? Now, some companies will say, buy my car because our car is better than you. We have better processes. Oh yeah, buy, you know, buy a Lexus, it's better, because we have better construction, better techniques, better whatever. My question is, why buy a car at all? You know, why should I buy from you? Think about in the computer industry. Who inspires you the most in the computer, the technology rating? Many times it's Apple. Apple comes out with products before you know you need them, because that is who, their DNA. Other companies respond to the market. We have to get people thinking here and working out. Unfortunately, most organizations, when you're profit-driven and performance-driven, you're this way. I only jokingly say that I could probably go into any company tomorrow and in 90 days have them be profitable. Because what would I do? I'd go in and I'd just start cutting overhead. I'd be laying people off. I'd be selling inventory. Now, a year from now, the company goes out of business. But if my bonus structure is built around the concept of turn it around in 90 days, I'm your person. I'm, av I'm available starting June 1. <laughs> but, you, but you don't want me. <laughs> you want someone that's going to be pushing your organization here. And that's the challenge. Why? Because we need to know why. Why your company? Why should I vote for you in the elections versus someone else?
because they've spent more money on marketing? No, I need to spend more money and think more as an intelligent citizen of, and I, I'm wondering where these candidates are gonna come from. I hope we can get them. What I worry about is as soon as they put their hat in the ring, the other side will go out on the internet and find every piece of dirt you know, that they possibly can, and then that person is dead before they even start. So, I, I uh, want you to think about this. This is, the, uh, I want you to think about leadership, and this is a quote, challenge of leadership is be strong, but not rude. We see that now. Be kind, but not weak. Be bold, but not a bully. Be thoughtful, but not lazy. Humble, not timid. Proud, but not arrogant. And have humor without folly. Is it that complicated? To you I say, we, all of us, have a vested interest in this game. We need to do what we can as educators to do a better job of training people that can go out and be leaders. We need to do a better job as employers in actually training the next generation of leaders today. And right now, companies are spending billions of dollars in training. Guess what? Where is the money going? Because <laughs> we're not seeing the leaders come out of it. It's culture, my friends. Leadership is culture. We need to start working. And, I, and so when I say leadership loss, it's not loss. We know where it's at. How are we going to get the people to follow it? And what role are we going to take in doing it? What role are we going to do to try and encourage better people to be candidates? It's very important because without it, we are in trouble. So I leave you with a quote from Gandhi. I love it. I'm going to start doing it on June 1st. Live as if you were to die tomorrow, but learn as if you were to live forever. So with that, I'll open it up for questions. Thank you. We have a question in the back. A microphone is going in that direction. Do you like your picture? Okay. Craig, I think I have this figure correctly. It was in the 40% range. I think it was 47%, but it should make everybody just shiver in their seats with what I'm about to tell you. A poll of millennials. I read five print newspapers daily. Famous for doing it. 47% of the millennials who bought a vehicle paid full price. Hmm. Now, that, that's if you don't understand how serious that is, we may be training somebody here who could be going to, you know, someday talk with North Korea if we can't take care of stuff now, State Department, you know, important jobs. Mm -hmm. And if you don't even know that there's a thousand or two thousand dollars or more that you're leaving on the table yeah. because you don't trust the capitalist system or your dad or whatever, I mean, we have to take care of these trust issues and make sure people understand that business has a real purpose mm -hmm. in your life. I mean, that's a scary figure, people. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that is so naive, and it's a distrustful behavior. Yeah. Any ideas on how to, I mean, that's just You know, it, thing. it's, I mean, we've got to teach people to be leaders in their own lives, and we have to teach them to be leaders in their organizations and in, in, in their governments. And the only thing we can do is work with them. But if no one is training anyone, where will they find this out? You know, I, I, and the trouble is, we also have to understand the cultural difference between other countries. Because if we go to a foreign country with an American perspective on something, we automatically are not going to be trusted in that foreign country, and so we will not be a leader. But there's a lot of things that we have to do. We need to do a better job of informing people. Other questions? Yes? Uh, go to one or two uh, leadership books. Oh, geez. Must reads. <laughs> uh, I should have put that slide up here. Uh, you know, I read a lot of books, and uh, you know, Cotter is one of the classics. You know, Cotter's favorite quote in one of his books is, 
uh, Culture Eats Strategy for Lunch. There's actually a book out called Culture Eats Strategy for Lunch, and that's the why of what things are going for. Uh, wow, I'll pull on my, some of my classmates, or my students' classmates. <laughs> some of them aren't here anymore. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Coos, The Leadership Challenge is an excellent book. Yeah, Maxwell, what's the title on that one? Yeah, I think it is leadership. Yeah, it's very creative. Yeah. That's why he sold like 25 million copies. You know, it's like McDonald's and their hamburgers. Okay, yes, next question. Yo, Dean, I need a couple of those slides. <laughs> you They're very them. powerful. You can have them. My pleasure. Got a question back with Sam. Where does leadership integrity come from? It, it comes from within. It is part of who you are and what your filter is, and it's also self-awareness. It's very hard to have integrity if you're not aware of your own weaknesses. And, and every day, you know, they say trust is built a drop at a time over time and lost in an instant. And, and I mean, I, you know, we, we talk in the leadership class about crucibles. You know, and one of my crucibles w happened, fortunately, early in my career when, you know, perhaps I didn't properly say what happened in a situation. And to this day, I remember that event. I remember that moment. And it's, it's one of those things that uh, I teach the new dean seminar for AACSB or the aspiring dean seminar for AACSB. And I tell them, I tell these people who want to be deans, I says, when you're a leader of an organization, a dean, you have people coming at you all the time from all directions. There's only one story you can remember, and that's the truth. Because if I tell you, Sam, okay, I can do this for you, but don't tell Mark. <laughs> I'm not being truthful. You know, I have just crossed a boundary, and that's me. And so I'm curious if you have a different flavor on it or a different slant on it, Sam. I think also it comes from upbringing. Yes. Oh, yeah. And it it's, comes from mm -hmm. the formative years that you've, yes. been, you've yeah. been talking about. Yep. And your faith. Yep, and your faith. But, yeah, if you look at most people's values and motives are set usually by eight, nine years old. So, Bill. Yeah, I want to know what the heck happened. <laughs> you know, the amount of effort that GE put into picking Emelt, and then what happened was he didn't quite do what they wanted him to do. And, and I blame the board of directors for that, the board of the company. But the problem is there's kind of a buyer's remorse issue that goes on in organizations. The, the board that brings in a leader sometimes is reluctant to take them out because they feel it may reflect poorly on them. And I think with Emil, they didn't move quick enough. And you can see the impact on GE. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dr. McAllister, for your uh, last lecture, or next to last lecture. But uh, Soon to be last lecture. <laughs> you, you talked about um, the importance of starting with why rather than the what and the how. Mm -hmm. And uh, starting with the why sometimes uh, can leave somebody uh, to be vulnerable and, and kind of put themselves out there. So can you give a few thoughts or suggestions on um, how, to, how, how to start with your why and how to overcome that vulnerability? <laughs> Ready, aim, shoot. You know, <laughs> or in most cases, shoot, ready, aim. You know, the thing is, people do not stop and think about why am I doing something? And I'm as guilty of it as anyone because I'm only mortal. And the thing is that uh, many, you know, the other day I was talking to someone, they called me on the phone, they wanted to do something. And I said, why are you doing this? They said, well, I want to do this and I want to do this because it's the right thing to do. And I said, why? Why are you doing this? What do you hope the outcome will be? And it is a question of how do you question yourself? How are you self-aware that you push yourself to say, you know, what is it that is the vision that I think leads this place? And so 
then we can always go back and say, now, you've asked for something. I can easily go back and say, well, how does it fit the why? You know, when I was dean of Crummer, I always said that the formula for successful business school is simple. Great faculty with great students with the resources to support them. That's genius. <laughs> but how many schools try to just fast pace and get a ranking? You can't do it. Because all the ranked schools already, they're spending gazillions of dollars. They have endowments out the, you know, whatever. And the thing is, you're not going to overspend them. You can only, if you think about what is the vision. Why are we doing this thing? And so when people would come to me and ask for things, I'd say, how does this benefit our students? How does this improve the faculty? How does this impact the resources that support the school? But if you're not careful, you, you, you go down a rabbit hole. And every time you go down a rabbit hole, you're doing a what? Dr. McAllister, over the course of your career, when you think back on it, what was one of the most significant turning points that tested you and helped you grow as a leader? I... <laughs> uh, oh, man. Uh, <laughs> I've had, fortunately, lots of crucible moments, and most of them didn't kill me. And so I, I, I hopefully learn from those. I think, first of all, I'll say is if you don't learn from your experiences, you're doomed. And the thing is, you find some people that are so, uh, I don't know, they're not humble, they're not, they don't have humility, and they are afraid to admit they made a mistake. And so I think if you go back, and I can remember in 19, maybe then, uh, 1973, Nancy and I were out, and uh, I was working in Oakland, California for Consolidated Foods. And I was the first step in the Teamster grievance process. And so I'm fresh out of college. I'm from upstate New York, where I don't even know what a union is. And now I'm you know, in the Bay Area with the Teamsters. And it was a special experience. Uh, they were always doing everything they could to help management succeed. Oh, well, wait, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> it was a very miserable experience. And um, I remember that uh, the first time I got involved with a grievance. And, uh, you know, I had the other side, you know, pointing fingers at me and saying, you're lying to me, you know, and we're the union and we're the only people that care about the employees. And it really forced me to say, okay, how can I respond to that with truth? When everything, you know, it's, it's like you see in Washington now. You know, the, the right says this, the, le the left says they're lying, or vice versa like that. That was a moment for me. And uh, what was truly a moment was one of the Teamster guys came to me after the meeting. He says, you know, Craig, you're not yelling enough. And I thought, if I have to be in a place where I have to yell, I don't want to be in that place. And, uh, and Nancy and I both said it was so much fun when I was out in Oakland, you know, Patty Hearst was kidnapped one day when I was going to work. And uh, the Symbionese Liberation Army was doing special things throughout the Bay Area. And BART went on strike and the striking workers were shooting, I mean guns, at the trains as they went by. And we said, you know, we don't want to live here. And so one of the first crucible moments for me was being in a place I was getting the most money, I, in fact, when I left the Bay Area to go back to New York and get a job there, I cut my salary probably almost in a fourth. But I said, I'm not going to live in that type of environment. I'm not going to bring my kids up in that type of environment. And so that was one of the times where you start to say, what's most important? And then you start looking for experiences. So that's, that's like the first one that really comes to mind. And, uh, oh, and by the way, there was the oil embargo, and so it was always fun to try and get to work <laughs> and find gas in the Bay Area, just, you know. But every time I've run into those, it always comes back with either being truthful with the employee or truthful with yourself. 
and you start with being truthful to yourself. Because if you're not truthful here, you can't be truthful out there. One more. Okay, take one more question. Ooh. Hey, Dean. My grandkids are getting anxious. Are, are leaders born or made? Yes. <laughs> I, classic argument. And, and my belief is leaders are made. They are made through their personal crucibles. They're made by being fortunate enough to have a great coach or a mentor. They're made when they have the opportunities to be exposed to increasingly difficult decisions that inform them and make them stronger. And they are better when they learn how to communicate effectively. And so if you ask people that are in my classes right now, one of my favorite questions is, so what? What you're telling me, so what? Why should I care? Convince me that it's important. So definitely made. You know, people say, well, John Kennedy was a natural born re leader, John F. Kennedy. My answer is no. He was brought up in an environment, getting back to what Sam said, he was brought up in an environment that developed leaders. Tell me how many organizations develop leaders. And I will tell you that we are missing out as a society in not developing more leaders. So with that, I say thank you. And uh, Pam, my former executive assistant, I'll let you have one more. Don't have a question, but I have to say thank you for being my leader. Hey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please Yay. join me. Yes. In thanking Craig for sharing his last leadership lecture with us, and Pam and I obviously think alike because my final statement was, and thank you for being our leader. Thank you. Please thank join you. us outside at the Sip and Sail reception. Set sail. Set sail.